Hey everyone, Steven here. Welcome to What Matters. As you may have noticed, I haven't really released many episodes over the past few months. Uh, it's been a little tough since I started grad school trying to find the time to conduct interviews and to edit them. But in 2019, I actually plan, I have a goal of releasing around two to three uh, interviews each month. So the podcast definitely has not stopped. And remember, if you have any topics or people that you'd like to see covered on the podcast, do let me know and we'll see about getting them on here. In this episode of What Matters, I sit down with Deke Copenhaver. Deke is the former mayor of Augusta, Georgia, and the principal of Copenhaver Consulting. And we discuss his upcoming book, The Change Maker. And this book is primarily on leadership, so we discuss how his past experiences have shaped his views on leadership. We talk about how to bridge the divides that we're seeing in politics and in society today and a whole range of other topics, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Remember to share on Facebook and Twitter, and right now you can find the podcast on your favorite podcasting platforms, all the major ones, um, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, so you can listen wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. All right. Well, I hope you enjoy this episode of What Matters. Deke, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Stephen. Glad to be here. Um, Yeah, it's really awesome to have you. Uh, You were the mayor of Augusta from 2005 to 2014. And uh, so a lot of my childhood. So and I I actually (laughs) grew up in um, uh, Millen, Georgia. And um, yeah, so they're in the CSRA. So I, I felt like I heard your name on the news every night. So it's really, <laughs> it's really awesome to have you on here. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. You're making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start off with your, uh, your background. Uh, tell me a little bit about your, um, where you grew up and your education. I will. I was actually born in Montreal and moved to Augusta, actually, to Columbia County when I was four years old. And I tell people, you know, I I think I've always been so inclusive because you talk about feeling like a fish out of water. Take a painfully shy kid with a thick Canadian accent and drop them in the deep south at four years old. But but so grew up in Columbia County, went to the University of Georgia, Um, actually it bounced around from the University of Georgia. I went when I was 17 and couldn't seem to find my way to a classroom that often. So I ended up coming back. I was there for any number of years, but coming back and finishing my degree up at what was then Augusta College, what's now Augusta University. Okay. Yeah, I actually started out at Augusta. Um, I was there for about a year and then transferred to UGA. And I think we both have political science degrees. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you something interesting about that is that when I graduated with a degree in political science, I thought that I would never use it. And so I went into banking in Atlanta because that's what I felt like my dad wanted me to do. But sort of becoming mayor, everything came full circle. Yeah. Well, um, so, so what did you do right after you uh, graduated? I went to work for what was then Nations Bank, what's now Bank of America in Atlanta. So uh, I was there for a number of years. I was in banking to begin with. Okay. And then, then went on to Beaufort, South Carolina, got into real estate and development, became a partner in the Sotheby's firm down there, moved back here, was in real estate with a company called Blanchard & Calhoun, then ran a nonprofit land conservation organization for four years, then became mayor. So I've okay. been in, in ba- banking, real estate and development, um, green space preservation, and mayor. So, and was a talk show host after I was out of office and now I'm consulting. So I, I tell people I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great. It gives you a lot of experience. Um, what, uh, so I, I've seen, I'm not even going to list all the different areas that you've, um, uh, you, you've been on the board of many nonprofits and done a lot of public service. So what led that uh, drive in you to give back to the community? When did that begin? <laughs> It, you, you know, it's interesting. I think I always wanted to give back and always, you know, believed in my community. But it really, when I first moved back to Augusta, I believe it was 1998. And I thought, well, you know, 
I've seen some new developments. You know, we had a minor league hockey team at that point. I thought, well, everything's going great. But uh, I was first asked in my early 30s to serve on a board of directors. So, and then really, I think what did it for me was in running the Central Savannah River Land Trust, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money, but I, I had probably done better in real estate, obviously, than that. But I learned at a relatively early age in my early 30s that to me, you know, it really, you've got to make a living in whatever you do. But I realized that I got more fulfillment out of doing something that had a major impact on my community than I did, you know, cashing a big paycheck. And with running the land trust, you know, we acquired green space around the city. So to be able to actually drive by open space and say, well, I, you know, I negotiated the deal on that and that's permanently protected for future generations that just really had an impact on me. Um, so what led that an environmental, it, it, were you always passionate about environmental um, uh, preservation? I've, you know, I grew up hunting and loving the outdoors. And I actually, when I was in real estate and development in Beaufort was when I really learned about land conservation and conservation easements, which set us aside you know, portions of open land in perpetuity. And it's interesting, I'd actually um, learned about that through a real estate transaction that I was going through, where I sold a large tract to a good friend of mine, and it had a conservation easement on it. So that's what, but I tell people, I think where I got my environmental bent was, and some of your listeners, I hope, um, remember Dr. Seuss, the book, The Lorax. And <laughs> the Lorax was like my favorite book as a kid. And so I think that that book is a children's book is really textbook land conservation or conservation in general. So you um, you worked there. That was your uh, you started up that nonprofit and you um, were the executive director for four years For four years. And then um, you decided to run for mayor. What made you think you were uh, you wanted to become <laughs> a mayor? That, that is a very good question. But so I went through a program called Leadership Georgia in 2004, which was the year before I ran for mayor. And I'm very competitive. And you go to, it's a group of people from around the state that visit communities throughout the state of Georgia to talk about some of their successes and some of their dif difficulties. But in traveling the state that year, I continually heard from people what's wrong with Augusta's politics? And my graduation weekend, that week, we had our third current or former elected official go under indictment. So I got off the bus in Thomasville, Georgia, and a good friend of mine, Eric Tannenblatt, who was then Governor Purdue's chief of staff, said, what are you guys putting in the water up there? And so that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. And I'm like, if, if something comes available, I'm going to run for it. And there had been um, talk of uh, Mayor Young, Bob Young, who preceded me, taking a job with um, the housing and, mm, excuse me, housing and urban development department as Southeast Regional Director. So he ended up announcing that in 2005. And so I said, well, here's my opportunity. So I just decided to run. Okay. And um, what were some of the um, challenges that Augusta was facing? Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that th there, there was the racial issue, and I'm sure yeah. that goes back a long way, but um, w what was um, what led to a lot of the issues? What was the current environment when you um, <clears throat> when you were uh, when you ran? Well, what what really made me decide to run was so I had handled the green space program for the city for four years. I was able to build consensus within the body, at least around that program. But at that point in time, our tax base was shrinking and we were losing population. And so studying urban demographics, or I'd sort of done that. And you can see in cities, when you get in that situation, when you're losing population and losing tax base, if it's allowed to continue without an intervention, it does not lead any place good. And I think Detroit's the prime example of that. But I felt like that if I knew that 
and didn't try to do something about it, part of it was on me. You know, if, if I had knowledge that this is what ends up if a city's going that way and I just didn't stand up and try to do something, then I was culpable as well. You ran and you won. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, did you, I think you had a runoff there and, um, the first year in 2005, there was a runoff. And, um, w- w- now what was unique about your campaign is there, there was no negative attack ads, in, uh, none of your campaigns. No, we just didn't do that. But I told my, my first campaign consultant, I said, look, that is not who I am and we're not going to do that. But I think that's to me in leadership positions, you need to set the tone. And we actually, and I, for your generation, I think one of the things that really made for a successful first campaign, we just had a bunch of 20 and 30 something year olds working with me and none of us knew how to run a political campaign, but there was so much energy around the campaign. I really think that's what drew people to it. It was that positive energy versus the negative energy that we're seeing in politics all too often or what seems to have become the norm these days. <clears throat> and, um, and you ran your, um, the, uh, your second two um, campaigns and you won by around, what, 65% in both of them? Yep. <clears throat> that's, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Um, so what, once you got in the office, what was the um, biggest issue, the first issue that you had to tackle as mayor? <laughs> the, the first issue was in, in my first commission meeting. Okay. This is, and so I, I had told my wife that after the election that year in 2005, I'm like, well, we'll take a vacation. We'll go someplace to get away. But I had not considered that when you run to fill an unexpired term, you take office immediately. So in my first commission meeting, and it was very racially charged, we had a group of white commissioners that wanted to fire our um, engineering director who happened to be an African-American female, but they also wanted to appoint a gentleman by the name of Bubba Willis as fire chief. So there was an African-American commissioner that traded out his vote and voted to fire Teresa and to hire Bubba. So it became so heated in the meeting that he had to be escorted from the commission chambers by the marshals. So that was, that was what I came into. And I'm like, well, okay, this is going to take a lot of work and a lot of, you know, really team building and to get beyond this issue. And it was kind of like, well, welcome to the, welcome to local government, Mr. Copenhaver. (laughs) How did you um, work to bridge that divide? You know, listening to older commissioners, they had not, the commission hadn't been on a retreat in years. So we scheduled a retreat for that January. Later on, we did bus tours of every district in the, um, every commission district in the city. My theory behind that was, well, you know, we've got commissioners who probably never set foot in certain areas of the city. And if we can you know, see the conditions that and the issues that we're dealing with in every part of the city, that'll help, you know, get people more on the same page. I took the commission through diversity training, which was the first time that had been done. And I, I don't know that that's been done since, but I, I was trying everything I could. <laughs> and you had a, um, a, even as a kid, you were, um, Bridging divides. It seems like it. Your your mother was a uh, a liberal Democrat, and your father a <laughs> conservative Republican. That is true. They never voted the same way in a pre- presidential election in over forty years of marriage. Well, but it really, you know, it, it's it was interesting. So I was brokering truces at the dinner table, but I think it really gave me the opportunity to see both sides. Definitely. Um, do you did you learn any uh, big insight there that could help us out as a nation today? Obviously, we're seeing um, probably greater polarization between the political parties than ever, um, and and quite a bit in the um, general population. To to really seek the common ground, um, you know, my mom and dad were both raised in small towns in Virginia, so they had a shared value system around family, you know, and just respecting their families. And that's the thing that I tell people is that, you know, we're not so 
far apart as a nation. If you get out there to the grassroots level, people want to live in clean, safe communities where they can educate their children, have access to jobs and opportunity and access to health care. So those are things that most Americans can agree upon. So I always focused on when in office and before office and after office on bringing people together around the common ground issues. And I think with the two political parties at this point, there are two or three issues that they can't come together around that they just it's almost like they just use it to fuel their base. You know, let's focus on what we let's get people just mad and afraid and angry based on the things that we can't agree on. And that, that, that to me is manipulation. Right. Yeah. That's actually really interesting. That's part of the reason why I started this podcast is my uh, perception of what's going on is um, we're seeing increasing polarization in the parties, but not necessarily so much in the population, you know, but the, most people just are fairly moderate um, but the problem is we're putting people into office that don't, that don't necessarily represent us. And that's just leading to policies that aren't best for the nation. Well, largely. It, it, and I agree with you, but having been um, a political science major, really my running for office was my own experiment in democracy. And I thought if you provide people with an alternative, they'll go to it. So the fact that I never went negative that, and I felt like, if I can't run on a proven track record of unifying leadership or my own vision, or uh, if I have to make people afraid of my opponent then, and I don't have a vision, I shouldn't be running in the first place. But the fortunate part for me was that uh, these are, you know, nonpartisan elections at a local level in municipal government statewide. So I didn't have to affiliate myself with a party and effectively toe a party line. Do you think your um, politics and your campaign style can be implemented on a larger you know, statewide or um, nationwide scale? Yeah. Scale. I do. I think it has to start at the local level. But if you know, if I can do it here in Augusta, it can be done other places. And I, I just one thing that I'm hoping through your podcast, as well as through you know something we'll talk about later is to encourage, you know, I made the point that my campaign, we weren't professional. We just had a bunch of energetic 20 and 30 somethings that believed in coming together to improve the city and it worked. So I'm hoping that your generation out there listening today or that I can touch in any way can use what I did here as a blueprint and say, well, Hey, you know, we can do that in our city. And I would love nothing more than to see that. So what do you think, um, what, what do you consider one of your greatest accomplish, accomplishments um, as mayor of Augusta? You know, I would say that now that I'm out of office to hear people say, well, you brought the community together. And that to me and my relationship with the African-American community, the bridging the racial divide was key. And it, to me, as a change-making leader, if you're seeking common ground, you need to oftentimes become the common ground. So in a majority African-American city, when you're winning with 65% of the vote, I grew up a big, um, huge, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my heroes. But I think that that shows that in an African -Amer majority African-American city, if a guy who's perceived to have been a wealthy white guy can run and win with that, that I was judged on the content of my character and not the color of my skin, which I, that, that means the world to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems like a, a lot of, um, you know, the nation in general could benefit from that, but um, a lot of other communities um, have similar um, issues going on. I, I moved from Macon. I lived in Macon, Georgia for about um, two years. And yeah. it, it's very similar to Augusta, it sounds like, where there was a lot of racial division after consolidation of um, city and county governments. Yeah. And, um, and you know, Macon's happened more recently, but um, Macon, Macon's definitely still seeing the effects of that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it, it's interesting, though, to me, because 
I'm always making a point to spend time out at the grassroots level. And I tell people, I go to the Y to work out every morning. And that's the biggest, you know, cross section of our community that you politically, racially, you know, religiously, but age wise, but it's like a family. If you're not there every morning, people wonder where you were. So I say, that's the Augusta that I see. You know, we, every year we have our annual arts in the heart of Augusta festival. So a festival that celebrates arts, culture, and diversity brings about 90,000 people to our city center every year. We've never had an incident. It's 22 countries represented. And I'm like, that's the Augusta that I see. But I think the, the divisiveness, whether it's at local or national level, it is more in the politics than it is at the grassroots level. And it, that's, that's disappointing to me because to me, leaders set the tone for the community. And if you're elected to office, you're by definition a leader. But I also would say my definition of leadership is leaders bring people together. They don't tear them apart and make them afraid of each other. That's to me, that's more akin to bullying. What um, what role do you think the private sector has in um, in leading this change? I think that the private sector has a huge role. You know, we're working on a campaign here in Augusta called All in Augusta that I'm chairing, but it's to raise six million dollars to tell Augusta's story, both internally and externally, to improve and enhance our downtown and also to develop new attractions. Well, <clears throat> my point with the business community is governments generally aren't visioning organizations, but businesses can be. So at this critical juncture for our community, I think that the private sector needs to take a stronger role in helping to shape the future of the city and do that in cooperation with local government as well, working in partnership. Right. Yeah, I, I remember I, I read one of your articles. You actually have a um, very interesting column with um, the Georgia Municipal Association. Um, it's called uh, the Leadership uh, Focus. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, you, you you write articles um, monthly there and they're published on there. You can find I'll, I'll link to it below, but um, you can find it at gmanet.com, dot um, I believe. And um, I was reading an interesting article on there that it had you talking about is where you were talking about bringing Starbucks in. But um, yes. yeah, but you were talking about how important it is for um, for companies to come into a community and how important it is to make it a good place for them to live in. And yeah. I think you've even talked with the Governor Dill about that. This is where, you know, arts come into play. Absolutely. I mean, and a strong arts and cultural community is just a key for economic development. You know, I may have made mention in that column, if not, after we recruited Starbucks, which was a $170 million investment and 120 new jobs. Since then, last year, they broke ground on an expansion, $100 million more dollars and 100 new jobs. So you're looking at $370 million in investment. But I was speaking to one of their consultants afterwards, and he said, I, I shouldn't be telling you this, but the other finalist, I won't say who the other finalist, he said, really, the strength of Augusta's arts and cultural community helped tip the balance in your favor because incentives are great. But if you're going to make a 20, 30 year investment as a company, you want to know that your employees are going to like the place they live. So that's important. Obviously, you know, labor quality is huge in economic development now, but but quality of life is too. And I think that that's something that sometimes, you know, people in elected office, when they want to make cuts, arts are the first thing they look to. But I can draw a direct line, you know, to a 300, I mean, nearly $400 million investment and, and hundreds of new jobs and the strength of our arts community. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, you know so often those are cut first, and uh, and and we're seeing more than ever that's they're they're being taken out of school systems, art programs, and yeah. music and all. 
Um, so speaking of the private sector, um, after you um, your term ended as mayor, you um, decided to open up your own consulting business. Tell me a little bit about Copenhagen <laughs> Consulting and, and the kind of work you do there. It, it runs the gamut. So it's, it's interesting. I had made mention that in my adult life, I've been in, you know, banking, real estate and development, nonprofit work, elected office for nine years. So I, my consulting services run the gamut of helping local governments, helping businesses to grow, helping nonprofits to raise funds. Um, I, I tell people I don't do law. I don't do, uh, I don't do accounting and I don't do insurance, but I have a pretty good working knowledge of a lot of different things, but I, it's just basically, I've always been a creative problem solver. And if you can bring a problem to me, whether you're a business or a nonprofit or an individual, I, I enjoy solving problems. So it's kind of, I might not be able to give you the answer you need now, but I know who I can call to get that answer to help you with your problem. But that's, that's fun to me. And I, it, I grew up, writing and painting and so i think that exposure to arts as a kid really helped teach me that creative problem solving that i use in my business and i used in office for nine years as well yeah i, I can definitely relate to you uh, on that that's that's kind of one of my primary um traits is my, my desire to always um figure something out and solve it um, and that's right now I'm in a master of public administration program at uh, Georgia State University. And um, that's largely why I'm interested in, um, in government work, yeah. because that's, you know, everything's so complicated there, but it's just oh, another yeah. puzzle. to it, solve. It really is. And I'll give you a great example. And you being an MPA student. <clears throat> so um, while I was in office, we had bike racks put on our buses. And so I put out on Facebook and Twitter, you know, thank goodness we've got bike racks on the buses. And somebody, you know, hit me back and said, well, what's, what's such a big deal about putting bike racks on the buses? I said, for, and I, I don't even know that I responded to him, but I said, first, you know, you have to build consensus within the body that it's a good idea to start with. And then we had to apply for federal grant funds to be able to put the bike racks, to pay for the bike racks. Then we had to go through the bid process to find the company that was going to do it. So all of that, it's not like you just put bike racks on a bus overnight. I mean, it took a year to get bike racks on buses. So there, there is a process, but that's what I learned on being on the inside. You, you've got to have somebody internally that diligently focuses on seeing these things through. And so I, I applaud you for your interest in government. I wish more people your age had it as well. Yeah. It's, it's also what makes um, consulting interesting, uh, the yeah. problem solving aspect. Uh, how would you compare the two uh, running, you know, running a city or running a, a consulting company? <clears throat> it's, it's very similar because I do a lot of the same stuff I did in office out of office, but I don't have to continually have the press chasing me around, which is actually nice. But, uh, but it's, it's very similar. And at the core of my business is, you know, I want to be successful, but it is that basis of really wanting to help people that, you know, I, I, I think if you want to work with people, people want to work with you. And that's, and what the difference I will say is that, that in the consulting world with what I'm doing now, I can pick and choose who I work with. Whereas in the elected world, that's not an option that you really have. And so, yeah, and I would say that that's the good thing about the consulting side of it is that I really purposely work with people and organizations whose core values mirror my own. And that's, you know, in politics, you can't always do that. But in the consulting world, you know, you can purposely choose who you want to work with, which I... I don't think, you know, if, if a business or an individual, if their core values don't really mirror my own, I'd prefer not to work with them. Yeah. If I, if I'm just put it this way, I'm never going to do anything just for the money. I just think it ethical 
leadership and being in ethical business is extremely important. Yeah. Well, um, let's go ahead and uh, transition to um, your book that you have coming out. Now, you have a book entitled The Change Maker, The Art of Building Better Leaders. And uh, do, do you have a date set for that to um, be published yet? We do not yet. I'm hoping for sometime this spring. Okay. And that is with uh, Forbes Books, right? Yep. Advantage Media, Advantage Forbes Books. Okay. What's the uh, primary purpose of this book? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the story of how I got to this point. And it's, I've just always led an interesting life. So back during the summer, I got an email from Forbes Bit Books um, inquiring if I had an interest in writing a book. So naturally, I thought it was a joke or a scam, and I almost deleted it. Fortunately, I didn't, and I followed through. And uh, But my first question to them was, how did you find me? And they said, we have a team that does internet-based research, and so we look for people that are producing content that's on, uh, on par with Forbes brand. So you referenced my Georgia Municipal Association column that I do monthly. I've put so much content content out there through the years that they found me, which my wife is like, well, I'm so glad that they found you and you didn't find them, but, but they are wonderful to work with, but it, it's, it just presents me with a great platform to get a message out there that you can do politics differently. You can maintain your character and integrity and you can still be successful. And that's, that's a message that I think, is very timely. It is very discouraging to me to see the, you know, the level of rhetoric and just, just mudslinging that goes on every day. I just, I don't think that's good for our country. Yeah. This is of course a book primarily on uh, leadership, how to practice mm -hmm. good leadership. Um, I want to ask you primarily, or what's your, uh, what's your, what definition of um, leadership are you operating off of? I've, had classes, of course, um, in, in the MPA program. And, and the first day I go in there and she, the teacher, the professor, she was like, a, a, she asked us what our definition was. And every time we'd come up with something, they'd shoot it down. And we just, the whole class we spent trying to work out a good definition, but what's a good definition that you operate off of? You know, to me, the only true power that any leader should be concerned with is the power to inspire. And good leadership to me is people that can inspire others to rally around a cause that's larger than themselves. So I, and here again, I'll get into, I think if you have to use manipulation to get the desired outcome, that's not leadership that's bullying. And I would say no one individual can do anything alone but if you can inspire people, that's the way great things happen. So to me, it's somebody who can inspire. What's the difference between a, um, a leader and a manager? I, manager may get more and more into the, the technical side of things and the implementation piece. And you've got to have that. You know, I, I, one of the things that I tell people is, in leadership, it's more important to know what you don't know than what you do know. And no one person can do everything, but I, I always tell people too that, you know, I like to build teams and the most successful teams, people have different skill sets and that's okay. But I, I get frustrated with committees because committees often aren't based on skill sets. They're based on either, I mean, in the best possible world, I'm, I'm glad that people want to participate on committees, but teams have goals and endpoints. You know, it's not like it's just let's establish a committee and talk about this. There's an old saying that committees are cul-de-sacs where good ideas go to die. And I've seen lots of <laughs> initiatives in my life that have been co committed to death. But but here again, and, and I so, you know, a manager might not be inspirational, but they can help with the implementation piece. But I think true leadership has to involve inspiring people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times you'll have managers that are actually managed by yeah. their, um, 
the subor- subordinates, um, which who, who are actually practicing uh, good leadership. Yeah. Um, so your um, your book is broken down into um, several chapters, and each chapter has a, a different um, message behind mm-hmm. it. Tell me some of the g- give me like two or three of the um, the chapters or, or the main focuses that you're you're trying to get through in this book. Well, <clears throat> there one is come together, and that goes back to a tenant to me of leadership is that leaders bring people together. It's just, I, I honestly believe when I see, you know, the fear mongering of politics today, that that's not leadership. I don't think people naturally want to be made to feel anxiety and fear that if you're instilling people with fear and anxiety to get your desired outcome, whether it's to win an election or, you know, to beat a competitor in your business, that, that to me is, is not leadership. I understand it, if winning at all costs is what you're about, I just don't believe that's leadership. Um, I had a great conversation <clears throat> with a friend of mine a number of months ago, and he said, you know, and, and people talk about the alpha, the alpha male, but said really in the animal kingdom, the alpha is the protector you know, of the pack. And so that to me is a better definition of alpha than some of the definitions we see that, you know, the top dog, I'm like, it's the alpha is the one that's providing protection and safety and security to the rest of the pack and bringing them together. So that's one, um, the road less traveled is another chapter that I think I, I definitely chose the road less traveled when I decided to run for mayor. I had a <clears throat> I had a good job, but I had people say, well, why would you want to get involved in all that? And my simple response was, because if everybody takes that approach or has that attitude, nothing's ever going to change. You know, you, you have to be willing to step out in faith. And I think that's part of leadership, too, is a lot of times le- leadership can be as simple as just doing something nobody else wants to do. Yeah. And um, one one stood out to me, uh, weather the storm, weather the storm. <laughs> and uh, I, I know that you, you know, reading um, your introduction to the book, um, I, I know I noticed that you had some um, tragedy early on in life. Uh, I, I don't know if that's precisely what weathering the storm <laughs> is about, but I, I know it's common. It's a common trait in leaders to um, have some sort of tragedy and what defines their leadership is how they overcome that tragedy. You want to talk a little bit about um, what's happened in your life and how you've um, coped with it and yeah. how that's made you a better leader? Yeah, I would be happy to talk to, about that. And that's the thing is that we're all part of the human condition. And whether you're a leader or you're not, or you're just any human being is going to face loss and and tragedy. So when I was 25 years old, um, when I was 24 years old, my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And my mother and I were extremely close. She was really the patriarch of the family. I'm the youngest of five children. Um, Had at that point, nine nieces and nephews. I became an uncle when I was nine. But so I, I was still relatively young. So she had taken a turn for the better and we were planning on because our whole family got together for thanksgiving trying to get her down to our house in beaufort south carolina on the coast for thanksgiving which is my dad built it for her and my mom just loved that place but she took a turn for the worse so my 25th birthday i was living in atlanta um this is the early 90s and my girlfriend at the time um had so she had tickets to the grand opening of the hard rock cafe that we were going to go to. But my father said, you know, please come home and be with your mother. So I did. And a week later, she, the day after Thanksgiving, she passed. So that tremendously rocked my world to be, I was working at the bank in Atlanta at that point in time. But then several years after that, I'd been married and moved to, um, Beaufort, South Carolina. And my wife at the time ended up, we were separated. We had, I didn't, 
she struggled with um, mental issues and I, I didn't realize the extent of them when we were married, but we had both decided that it would be best for her to move back to Atlanta and she took her own life. So by the time I was 30, I was, I had lost my mom and become a widower in less than five years. Wow. And I remember it at that point in time, I thought, you know, uh, it, it, it was difficult to deal with. And I mean, that's a pretty young age, but the flip side of that is, you know, I, I like to use my own story to say, you can not just survive these, but you can thrive from these situations. And there have been people with mental health issues that have been considering, you know, taking their own lives that I've been able to, because I had that connection from having gone through it myself, I've been able to help a lot of people through that. And, you know, I go back to common ground issues. Every family I know, every individual I know has somehow been in, impacted by mental health issues, whether it's family members, loved ones, friends, but the same thing with cancer. I don't know anybody who hasn't had that insidious disease impact their lives in some way. So I, here again, I, I talk about the common ground issues, but literally our humanity and our vulnerability are common ground issues because that binds all of us. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people after um, some incidents like that, um, you're faced with a decision, you know, whether you can, you can become bitter or angry or, you know, positive and try to, you know, just make the world a better place. And it seems like you definitely did the latter. You've got to be that way and you've got to keep a good attitude. And that's something that, you know, and I'll t tell you what else helps too is a healthy sense of humor mm -hmm. to, to be able to laugh at the absurdity of life <laughs> because it, it can get a little crazy at times, but I've, I've always wanted to use, you know, whatever experience I've had, whether that be good or bad to help others. And I think that's just, that's kind of in my DNA. That's who I am. And, you know, I, and I consider myself fortunate to be able to have been given platforms to do that, whether it was nine years in public service. And I, people would say, well, you know, tell me about being mayor, particularly kids. I spoke in schools all the time. I'd say, well, if, if you want to help people in your community, I'm sitting in the best seat to do it. And, you know, now I've been granted another tremendous platform through this book to, to hopefully touch some lives and help some people. Yeah. And um, so one of the um, defining things of your uh, mayorship and um, it's, you actually have two chapters um, in the book, uh, one learn to listen and one um, be open. And um, one thing I noticed is um, you're you're very transparent um, um, throughout your um, your time as mayor, and um, uh, you know a lot of people have problems with, especially uh, I'm sure it's all over, but especially in southern politics of some mayors being um, shady in some of their <laughs> business. But um, you you kept a really good Im image. In fact, your uh, nickname was what Boy King. Yes, after the Boy King. Yeah. Was, what was that? Was that uh, uh, after like Boy Scouts or? Uh, I do not know, but <laughs> but I'll tell you, it, it's funny. I so that was a local columnist, Sylvia Cooper, that nicknamed me the Boy King. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I was in my 40s and I was still the Boy King, mm -hmm. and I never took offense at that. But I I had somebody from the Carl Vincent Institute of Government at the University of Georgia. So that may not bother you, but you know, you're the younger generation of Augustans. I mean, whether it's 20 somethings and younger 30 somethings, you're their mayor. And what do you think that says to them that, you know, you're their mayor, but you're being called the boy King. And I never looked at it that way, but, but I would tell people that I'm like, I'm in my forties. I know people in their thirties that are CEOs or people in their twenties. I know people a lot younger than me that, you know, I'm still the boy King, but I'm like, it's almost dismissive towards a younger generation. And to me, that's, and I, I'll tell you philosophy I have on that. So I always focused on building a city that could recruit, 
recruit and retain the best and brightest young minds. But so often, you know, after I've gotten out of office, I'll be in board meetings or in, you know, different groups and people say, well, how do we engage millennials? And my response would be, there's nobody under 40 sitting in this room. I'm like, that, that would basically be like a bunch of older white men sitting around talking about how do we address race relations? You know, I'm like, they, younger generation needs to be included in the dialogue and they need to be talked to and not talked over. That's, that's just to, to me, you know, I, I still have a great relationship with the younger generation in Augusta. And to me, they inspire me. You know, we've got all these entrepreneurs here that I was with uh, two of them this morning that a lot of guys and girls that have lived in Los Angeles, Dallas, New York, Atlanta, Charleston, but they've purposely moved home to make a difference. And it used to be that in my generation, a lot of people would move away and get married and then move home. But these younger people, I mean, they, they're doing tremendous things in their fields and starting businesses, but they purposely moved back to Augusta because they wanted to make a difference. And so I'm like, by all means, you know, let me help you however I can. Cause yeah. I think all too often in leadership or in communities, you know, the old guard can hang on to perceived power for too long. And to me, it's, we need to willingly pass the baton of leadership and mentor the younger generation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, people talk crap about millennials all the time, but um, that's a, a good thing about millennials is that a lot of them are driven by a deeper sense of purpose. Yeah. Whereas older generations might have made what's, you know, most rational financially. Um, but millennials will move back to their hometown and re really try to uh, make it a better place. A lot well, of times. And, and, and that's, it, it's very funny to me. I'm like, in a lot of ways, I think I have the sensibilities of a millennial, <laughs> but, uh, but I, it's funny too. So my wife and I don't have kids and I've got, you know, tons of millennial nieces and nephews that were like brothers and sisters to me when I was a kid, but I was with uh, a friend and I was saying, well, what are you guys? I, we were having lunch and he said, oh my gosh, I became my dad this weekend. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, we were taking the kids to Atlanta and I'm like, do you want me to pull over this car and go, go back to Augusta? But it was at that moment, I'm like, well, having never had kids, maybe I never became my dad. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the, uh, with the boy King thing, I, I, I assumed it, it was a, you know, a reference to um, how optimistic you are all the time and um, how open to others you are. Um, that, but, but, that and boy, boyish looks, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> what are the, um, so, so you seem to really, um, you obviously don't really practice Machiavellian um, techniques or politics a lot. No. And um, you, you're very, you want to uh, really appear open and, and, and be open to others. And uh, what's the real importance behind that? I, I know that you, uh, you were, you were always, you always had an open door. You had, kind of like an open door policy well, yeah. as, as mayor of Augusta. And um, at, at what point do you have to, you know, just kind of, you know, shut the door and, you know, take care of business? Or, I, uh, yeah. I, so I believe it's very important to be open because openness and transparency builds trust. And, you know, closed doors build suspicion where open doors build trust. I, I probably, to be perfectly honest, made myself almost too accessible. Um, and, but I, I think that did contribute to building trust. It built trust with the press even because the press knew they could reporters. I had a bowl of candy sitting on a table in my office and reporters would walk in and just start eating my candy. And I'm like, Hey man, what's the question? <laughs> but, I, but, but it, that, that's, that's a concern to me these days that, you know, it, if you're not open as elected official, you know, it, it undermines the trust. And I will tell you, it's a concern to me. I mentioned I had a radio show for a year. And the reason I did that was because I felt like at this critical juncture in time, 
you need a trusted voice from the community getting information out there to citizens because it's a big concern for me when most people don't seem to trust elected officials or the media that that's it seems to be a slippery slope to me where where can you get good information so i applaud you for doing this podcast because it's and i like that you're doing it long form too because i always tell people that i never spoke in sound bites or rhetoric because they don't educate anybody and something like this a long form conversation more than an interview really does help to educate people well, well thank you um your your show you actually um how long was that going it went for close to a year yeah and it started um during the campaign season i believe um of 2016 that was a crazy time to dive into it yeah well it was and i'll get so I always believe in total immersive learning mm -hmm. and dropping myself in the deep end. So the first I never, I had guest hosted for a local radio show host, but I never had a radio show. So the day, first day that I went in, I didn't even know where to plug my headphones in. And, and <laughs> so I had no instruction whatsoever, but I think that's what people responded to was the fact that it was non-scripted. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say that the station being on conservative talk radio, I don't think that they could ever figure it out. But but I, I don't necessarily know. I don't think conservative talk radio is building an audience and it, any more so than I think the major media outlets are. I, I am working on writing my Georgia Municipal Association column today. And I made the point that in, in talking to your average man or woman on the street and I do it around the nation and I do it, you know, in a bar, in a restaurant or in a park and just strike. I, I just love to talk to people, but generally the two things I hear with regards to politics are people say, why can't the two sides just work together for the betterment of the country? Or there's another comment I hear that it's just gotten so ridiculous that I've tuned it out. And that's sort of the place where I am now because I'm like, I, I don't know if I can believe any of it. Right. And I, I also know that, you know, certain news outlets have a conservative bias and certain have a liberal bias. So I, I used to sit and watch flip back and forth between CNN and Fox at night at times. And I'm like, it looks like they're reporting on two different countries. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so I tell people I try to tune it out now. And my focus is just on trying to make the biggest difference to improve my community that I can. And now with this opportunity through the book to sort of take that message nationwide at the grassroots level, because if positive change is going to come and sustainable change, it's got to come from the ground, ground up, not from the top down. And I, I honestly believe that here again, I hope your listeners get inspired to have their own campaign, run for local office. That's really where the rubber meets the road and don't do it for a career in politics. All right. Um, yeah, that I, I really, I'm, I'm somewhere similar as far as, you know, media goes. Obviously I started up a podcast because I, I was kind of frustrated with, with the way things were. And the only thing that made sense was, you know, watching the liberal um, and conservative media and trying to figure out what, is common between both of it, but there's not very much common and <laughs> not, not much common ground. And that's a lot of time to consider yeah. both. So, so my focus now is just focus on big ideas and philosophy and try to understand the undercurrent behind the, um, you know, the political philosophy that's going on. Um, well, and, 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 but that's, that's the thing to me. And I, you know, and fortunately I, local races being nonpartisan where I could be myself. I didn't have anybody, you know, handling me or telling me what I needed to say or to do. And so I could go by feel and I've learned to really trust my gut. But, but really the concerning thing to me is I've seen, you know, elected officials that I know in campaigns where I'm sitting there going, well, that's not the person that I know. That's just very out of character for them. And I've always said, if I had to compromise my character, 
I would rather lose. You know, it, if I have to be somebody I'm not to get elected to, you know, get to a certain demographic, that to me is just, it's concerning when you're willing to sacrifice your character to win an election. Right. Um, and, th- and that ties in well, of course, with your, um, the last chapter, um, demonstrate enduring character. Yeah. Um, what, what's, what's the primary tip that you would give to someone, um, no matter what their, uh, leadership style might be to, to make them a, a change maker in the community? Hmm. I, I think there are several things. One is you've got to learn to listen without prejudice. And I, I say that to say, uh, if, if you can't, if you automatically get defensive when you're talking to somebody, even if, you know, you have differing views, you should be able to have a conversation. So if you get defensive automatically, how are you ever going to resolve the problem? So I think learning to listen without prejudice is key. It's not the easiest thing to do because we live in a state of heightened anxiety and, you know, we live in a state of immediacy where people are trying to interject themselves in the conversation and oftentimes talk over each other. But really that listening without, with, without prejudice is a key piece. The maintaining your integrity piece is key too, because as soon as you start to compromise yourself, you undermine your ability to lead. Consistency is key. That's, um, I, honesty is key too. I mean, and all of these things, nothing, none of this is new. I was at the thing that's new is I was able to, you know, use it in politics and be successful, which most people would say that you can't do that these days. But, but that, that character, that integrity, you know, people have to be able to trust your leadership in order to follow you. And I, I'm, you know, mentioning consistency again, if you're, saying one thing and doing another and it, or one of the things that I've seen politicians do is they establish themselves in an intractable position prior to gathering all the information on an issue. So when you publicly establish yourself in an intractable position, you no longer have a seat at the negotiating table. And in order to, you know, to make change happen, you have to be there at the negotiating table. So here again, those those are all things that I would say for your listeners. They're, they're not new. They're, you know, they're time tested and really forms of leadership that have worked. But I think in today's world, people want to sacrifice expediency to get to the end of something as opposed to doing the hard work that it, takes to be a leader it takes time and effort and patience and you know patience with yourself and patience with others because i say patience with yourself because in leadership position you're gonna make mistakes yeah but but i would also say for for your listeners be willing to own up when you make a mistake that's one thing that i see with elected officials is when it's like and i just picture that they've got a handler saying well you can't admit to that you know, it, it either makes you look weak or it's, you know, it, your approval rating is going to dive by so much if you if you tell the truth on this issue. But it's always going to come out. You know, it's it, it's so if you just if you make a mistake, just go ahead and own up to it and move on. What was the um, the biggest criticism of um, your leadership, either as mayor or as a community <laughs> leader? Yeah. And how did you um, how did you overcome that? I, I, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, there were the biggest criticisms I heard from me from, from the vocal minority were he's too positive and he's non-controversial. <laughs> so I, I actually met um, former ambassador and um, former mayor, Andrew Young. We uh-huh. had l- lunch together and he asked me that question. And I said that I'm too positive and I'm non-controversial. And he was like, that's just crazy. I'm like, if that's the biggest knock against me, that's I'll take that all day long. But it but and people said that I ducked controversy. 
I'm like, I lived in the middle of controversy every day for nine years. There was no running from controversy, but, but I will say that that's the thing too, is in leadership positions, you're, you're not going to make everybody happy and you're going to have, and I'll give as an example, putting this book out there. I know that not everybody's going to like the book. And <clears throat> personally, I think it speaks to the silent majority, the moderates that you and I have discussed. So probably it will get the extremes, you know, if they read it, they won't like it, but that's okay. Cause you can't please everybody. And I've just, I've always governed to the silent majority as opposed to governing to the extremes. And that to me is the way you make progress. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's actually seems to be a, a, a key um, a thing that you practice a lot, not giving, giving uh, grease to the squeaky wheel. Yeah. And yeah. not, not adding fuel to the fire. It's right. And I, to me, I go back and I'm competitive too. And I realize people would be like, why did you not lose your cool and just go off on that person? I'm like, because that's what people, and I, I love sports, but if people want you to lose your cool and I'm like, once somebody gets in your head, they're, I mean, they're controlling you. You're not controlling the situation any longer. And when you lose your cool, you know, that's somebody has gotten in your head. Right. Well, you're obviously a, a great leader. So what do, what do you think your future of leadership is? It, it, does it lie in the um, private sector and, you know, helping the community from there? Or are you interested in maybe another political position or government work in the future? You know, I, I think for now it's the private sector. And so, so I had a lot of people ask me, when I was in office and after office, you know, why don't you run for the state house or, you know, Congress or something? And I, I, but I'm so independent minded. And I said, look, if, if I wasn't willing to compromise myself, how effective would I be? What would happen? They said, well, you'd be ostracized. And I'm, I'm like, well, if I'm ostracized, how effective can I be? And the concerning thing to me, and I, you know, I have friends on both sides of the aisle, but once you, you know, it, a lot of it goes back to campaign finance that once you start taking money from donors who you are one side or the other, and you owe favors, then can you really speak with your own voice and make your own decisions without having those influenced by outside influences, I guess I would say, but that, so I, I don't, I, I'm hopeful though, that for your generation, when you, when you see crowdfunding and, um, and you see podcasts and everything that could level the playing field to where, you know, in your generation where technology is so prevalent that somebody could get a message out there in a way that it's not, you know, it, it's directly to the people and that, that excites me. And if that person's out there, call me, I'd be happy to consult you for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah I've, I've, you know, kind of my eyes have been open somewhat recently to how much you can um, affect change through the private sector. Um, seeing people like Elon Musk, it's, yeah. it's more than just, you know, it, it's not about the bottom line so much. And he started up Tesla to, fix you know, environmental concerns to provide electric cars to everyone. Now he has SpaceX. Um, and, and it seems like um, in the private sector, if it's done in a certain way, um, you can really have this core philosophy of giving back and then the money follows. And, that, and that's a fortunate thing that might not have always been true in the past. Well, and that's what I've always said to younger people. I'm like, you know, find something to do with your life that you love because you're going to, you have to make a living. But if you find something that you love doing, you're going to be successful at it. And it's sort of, I, I don't have anybody working with me right now. I know that once the book comes out, I'm going to have to have some help, but I always, I mean, whether it was in the mayor's office or it's been in the private sector in this office, I always have wanted to be a place that people want to go to work. I think, you know, you're going to get more out of your employees, particularly if, 
you know, if they know that there, there's a big picture here and that you're working towards something that's bigger than yourself. And that's, that's why I think in, I had one of my dearest friends, Karen Nixon was my executive assistant. I had another great girl, Natasha McFarley, who was my administrative assistant. But Karen had worked in New York City at Chase Manhattan Bank. And she and her husband, after 9-11, had lost so many friends in New York. He was from Augusta. They moved back here. But I always said Karen was overworked, underpaid, and loved every minute of it because she was bought into the philosophy of what we were doing out of the mayor's office, which was, you know, changing the lives of people in the city. So I think that, you know, it, it I believe in capitalism and I want to see people do well, but I also think that you can do well by doing good. And that's, that's always been my focus. Yeah. Well, um, if you had to come up with one thing that matters most that we need to be talking about uh, more than ever, what would that be? I, I would say community because that's what I believe in. And I just believe in the power of community, whether it's an online community, whether it's, you know, a community where you live and I view businesses and organizations that are best run as communities. You know, I look at, at organizations where CEOs value their employees and really, you know, take care of their employees. But I think it's really community that we need to be talking about. And that doesn't appear to be at the core, not that it ever was, but it's really not at the core of the political battle right now. And, you know, it, it, I, I always tell people you can't spell with, with, you know, you can't spell community without unity. And the divisiveness is not moving the needle in the direction of unity. So to build stronger communities, we need more unity on issues. And I think part of that comes from acceptance. You know, I, not everybody's going to look like me or think like me or act like me. And I personally don't think I'm going to grow as a person unless I'm around people that don't look like me or act like me or think like me, but that's okay. And I tell people too, you know, just because somebody was socialized in a different way than me, you know, I've got a great friend who serves an elected office here at Augusta that um, African American gentleman by the name of Ben Hassan, who grew up in an impoverished inner city neighborhood. Well, we don't agree politically on everything, but you know, I grew up in a golf course community. He grew up in the inner city. We were socialized in different ways. And just because we don't share each other, I mean, growing up in those two different situations, your worldviews are going to be different and that's okay. But that doesn't make, you know, because he was socialized in a certain way, that doesn't make him bad or wrong. And I think that's the thing about politics now. It's when this, the other side is demonized just for being the other side. So I, I think it's community and how do we build stronger communities? Cause here again, I think it all starts at the local level. I, I think, you know, if we think we're going to go fix the two party system, I just don't, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Right. Well, there you have it. The uh, community is the, um, the thing that we need to focus on and we need to fight against the status quo. And in order to do that, you have to be a change maker. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for um, doing the interview. Um, I think it's been very interesting and once we once the book comes out, I'm going to you know, share it on all the social media uh, channels and make sure to get it out there. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Deke. Well, thank you so much. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure being with you, and I'd love to come back at some point as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely have you. All okay. right, you have a good one. Thanks, man. You too.